Cole Rush, this may be the last podcast of 2022. Ever. Um, well, not of all time, because I'm sure there'll be podcasts coming out from other fine uh, content providers. Lesser creators. Until. Lesser creators. Yes, that's the phrase I was looking for. <laughs> no, but um, so we're, we're ending the year right with a page to screen of the Lord of the Rings, the two towers. Now, last year on this time, we talked about Fellowship of the Rings. Uh, because that was the uh, was it the 20, 20th anniversary, I think, then. And now we're talking about the 20th anniversary of the Two Towers. Now, we're talking about the theatrical cut. I think I had contacted you way late in the game because things have been kind of frantic at the end of the year here and saying, hey, I'd like to talk about the extended edition. And you're like, I just watched the theatrical. Um, or, <laughs> or you had planned to watch it or something like, okay, don't worry about it. We'll talk about the theatrical. Um, and then I saw that you had texted me while you were watching the film, apparently, and you had said more like bored of the rings. <laughs> so we're going to get into it because I love this movie. Don't love the book, love the film, but I didn't always. Did I ever tell you about, well, first of all, how you doing, Cole? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm living the dream. I am no longer bored because the movie has ended. Uh, it, I started it on Monday and it just ended just now. Um, so if I had watched <laughs> the extended cut, oh, oh. it might have fled into uh, it, into exactly you know our recording time. Um, you know, it was funny. I was I was on HBO Max where they have Lord of the Rings movies, and there was a little voice in my head, a little Ian saying like, "Oh, we should watch the extended cut." And I was like, "Well, he usually says these things, and he didn't this time, so I'm just gonna watch the theatrical." Um, without the 18 minutes of fan club credits. And um, that was my mistake because then when I finished the movie, I was like, no, we definitely watched the extended cut last year. So um, I will rectify my mistake for Return of the King when we eventually cover it. But um, certainly didn't hate the movie, but uh, my text kind of says it all. I was, I was fairly bored. And I think there are myriad reasons for it. And there's one very large kind of like overarching thought about fantasy adaptations i want to discuss at some point but i will wait until we actually get some thoughts about the movie in first before i i break everything down into pure thought rubble no that's that's great um because you as an avid fantasy reader and and critic i think you're going to bring some some real value here um and i think we're going to find some agreement in at least your thoughts from what i remember of reading fellowship from our discussion last year which is that you thought it was, you know, it, it's one of those works that is incredibly important. I mean, foundational in a lot of respects, but kind of hard to get through, especially if you have read the evolution of the genre that people who love Tolkien or whomever have come along there, they're inspired to write and modernize and, and uh, you know, come up with different you know, languages and ways to express these ideas that, you know, Tolkien himself pops probably couldn't have even conceived of when he wrote these books. Um, I certainly felt that way reading The Two Towers. And I was surprised because my memory of the trilogy is kind of hazy. I haven't watched it since uh, Peter Jackson's Hobbit trilogy came out about 10 years ago. I went back and revisited Lord of the Rings. And I distinctly remember the Shalob spider fight in the cave. Mm -hmm. That's in the novel. That's at the towards the very end of the book. It's basically the but climax. Right. But it's not in the film. Like the film ends... I, I can't remember. Uh, I, I could probably thumb through this thing again, but I feel like the movie ends at like the three quarters or the halfway point of the book with yep. this 45 minute battle of Helm's Deep and the um, uh, and the attack on Isildur with the Ents. Uh, whereas in the book, I remember that coming way earlier and lasting. It seemed like just a few pages. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, you know, Jackson really stretched this thing out, I think, to the to the benefit, because I read the novel as I do a lot of these longer books. I did like 11 to 12 pages at a time over the course of about a month, you know, just get up very early, read a little bit and then move on. And eventually I finished the whole thing and watching the movie. It was as if I was watching it for the first time because I'd forgotten a lot about the events of things. I remember them being in the book and I'm like, this is way more exciting on screen. I feel like Jackson and, and uh, his, his co-writers really took the best, most exciting ideas and parts of the book and extrapolated those. And in the, you know, the hiring of the actors and, and the tweaking of the screenwriting made them exciting in a way that they weren't on the page. 
Yeah, I, I tend to agree for the most part. I mean, uh, I don't want to beat a dead horse here. It's <clears throat> reading these books for me is like a window to the past and a, a an appreciation of what this seminal series sparked. Um, because again, it's it's like I can look at my bookshelves over here and pretty much every single book on there, or at least 80% of them, you know, all the fantasy and sci-fi owes something in parts large and small to Lord of the Rings. Um, and I think that part of that is a detractor when I read these books because it's just a little bit on the boring side for me. It it doesn't play with structure in the way that novelists can now because there was really no precedent for it. Uh, from what I remember of the book, a lot of it is like you get one perspective, you know, of the some members of the fellowship, like the Gimli, Legolas, Aragorn, Cater, and they they have a big chunk of the book. And then you have a big chunk with Mary, uh, Mary and Pippin, and you have a big chunk with Frodo and Sam, and it's you don't get a lot of interlaced points of view. You just kind of have to assume that all of these things are happening at once, uh, which is what I appreciate about the movie, is it obviously gives us those cuts. Um, it works. I actually really like this book. Of the three, it's probably my favorite. Okay. Um, there are a few things that I really appreciate about it. Uh, the one I don't appreciate is how boring the tracking is with Aragorn as a ranger and everything. I love the Ents in the book um, because even to this day, they feel utterly unique to me. And Tolkien had a really futuristic vision of a species beyond anything we had imagined before. Um, I mean, he essentially popularized halflings in the form of hobbits, right? But the trees and their attitudes towards slowness was something that I thought was really novel and really intriguing uh, and their unwillingness to budge from <laughs> their ways. Um, so in a way, you know, they're good, but they're also like kind of stuck in tradition. Um, I don't think the movie did it very well. Uh, I think that you kind of lose a core facet of what the Ents are when you have hobbits riding them because for a species <laughs> predicated on being slow, wouldn't it be faster for the hobbits to just go ahead and wait for the ants to catch up? It kind of ruins it for me. And then the ants start talking, oh, like we love being slow, but like this all happens in the course of a few minutes in the movie. Um, and then I enjoy the whole, uh, is it Worm Tongue? I always think worm it's Wormwood. I just worm watched tongue. the Matilda musical last night and her last name is Wormwood. So I'm getting it a little bit jumbled. Um, no, it's uh, it's Grima Worm Tongue, yes. So I love that whole section. Um, you know, and the king is kind of like getting out of this old Sauron possession phase. Uh, Gandalf kind of releases everybody. I, I really like that too. Um, my favorite part of the entire movie is is probably the worst part, and it takes about five seconds. <clears throat> and it's when one of the Urukai says, "Looks like meat's back on the menu, boys." Um, <laughs> how do they know what a menu is, and why is that something that they would say proverbially to each other? Fucking hilarious. Um, but then, uh, as we said, the book ends with the Shelob scene, which I think is super cool. I think it's one of the best giant spider scenes in all of fantasy. And I have read surprisingly many. There is one <laughs> that I like better. Um, which one is it? It's called Children of Time. Uh, I think I've talked about it on the show before, but really, really short spark notes is humanity terraforms the planet, sends a hyper evolution virus to the planet with monkeys in tow. The monkeys die, but a spider survives and spiders evolve sentience. And it is really cool. Uh, it was optioned for a script. Don't know how that's going to work out. But um, yeah, Shelob, I think, was a really cool way to end it. Because if I recall in the book, it's like um, Sam thinks Frodo has died. But then one of the Uruk higher orcs basically says uh, Shelob only devours her prey alive. So Sam sort of like has this revelation that Frodo is alive and it's essentially like a cut to black. And I think that's the ultimate cliffhanger. You have the climax of the Shelob battle and it's really intriguing. So that's my rambling review of both, uh, forms of the media here. Um, I was, I was relatively bored with the movie. I think a lot of the, the tracking and ranger scenes get old. I think a lot of the politicking gets old. I don't think the battle is all that much to enjoy on screen, quite frankly. Um, really? Yeah, I just like the scope of it doesn't doesn't get me. And as I hinted at before, there's kind of a, a bigger reason behind all of this. And I will get to it, but I want to give you the floor for a bit to kind of like 
react to everything that I've just spilled out of my brain hole. Have I ever told you about the first time I ever saw the two towers? I don't believe you have. Okay. You were about to, but then you asked how I was doing, and now we're here. Okay. <clears throat> it was Christmas Eve, 2002. Uh, went to go see a double feature. Don't know why, but I was with my fiance at the time and our mutual uh, friend slash acquaintance, Brad. And we were just going to go see two movies, two long movies on Christmas Eve. Why not spend afternoon out? We saw The Lord of the Rings. Oh, it was all, uh, Brad's mom was there as well. Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers, followed by uh, Adaptation starring Nicolas Cage, uh, the Charlie Kaufman film. A very bizarre, you know, couple of movies. Yeah, wow. But um, during The Two Towers, I, I didn't like the movie. I didn't like the first Lord of the Rings film so much. So I'm like, I'm never going to watch these again. But in the what I'll refer to as the nascent Internet, uh, I had heard a lot of people saying, look, even if you're one of those complete idiots who hated the Fellowship of the Ring, I mean, there's probably like 10 of you out there, right? You're going to love the two towers because it's full of action and an intrigue. And it's just, it's a far better movie, even though the fellowship is a masterpiece. I'm like, well, you can't argue with that. I at least got to give it a try. So I talked to uh, my fiance and, and my roommate, Brad, and I said, let's go do this. And they both looked at me askance. They're like, that first movie sucked. I'm like, but they say the second one is supposed to make it all worthwhile. We go watch it about halfway through the film. I'm bored. So I looked to my left and I could see my wife scowling at me. I look to my right and I see my dear friend slash roommate scowling at me. They are shooting daggers and arrows into my brain more acute than Legolas on and his best day. I believe I know this Brad and he wasn't really a scowler. He pretty, was a pretty gregarious day. guy. Yes. And so that should give you an example of right. how little they thought of this <laughs> three hour epic. And this is only the halfway point, mind you. Um, and I was, I was not faring much better. I was like, I, you know, I just don't care about any of these things. It's slow. It became a meme. Like the first movie was all about revealing the ring. There's so many shots of people going like, you know, opening up their hands, like, Oh my God, what do you think's in here? Let me guess. It's a ring. What do you think it is now? It's a ring. The next movie. And there was some of this in the first one, but particularly in uh, two towers, sweeping vista shots i mean it opens with one practically of you know swirling around these mountains or swirling around these hills like we get it it's a long journey come on um so yeah i was convinced that these movies were all trash and i think i only watched return of the king the next year the couple years later whenever it came out uh, out of obligation because i'm a completist uh, hated that too 10 years ago when the hobbit came out i was like it's time to give these movies a second shot because other people, not the internet, but people I knew who were flabbergasted and offended when I said I hated Lord of the Rings said, have you watched the extended editions? And I said, why on earth would I watch <laughs> more of something I hate? And they told me to a person, no, the extended editions make the, the films much better because there's a lot of connective tissue. There's backstory. There's pacing injected where pacing needs to be injected. And I think that that's what struck a chord when we were talking about the Ents. I can't remember all of the differences, but there may have been more stuff in there to kind of drag out that deliberation because I agree. The slowness of Tolkien's writing really becomes effective when you're talking about trees that take centuries to make a decision. Um, so, or my wife. Wow. <laughs> wow. Anyway, I hope she doesn't listen to this because I, uh, I make fun of her decision-making a lot and she goes, stop it. <laughs> she takes decision-making to the nth degree. <laughs> Anyway, uh, oh, yeah, so long and short of it is I watched the extended editions. I, I think I was like horribly sick for some reason, for like a long weekend. My wife and older son were out of town. So I had like four or five days when I was by myself dying in bed. Why not watch these torturous movies? These things blew my mind. I was so happy and I found an appreciation for them through the extended editions. Now, going back and watching the theatrical cut this time of Two Towers, I could tell that there was stuff missing, but I couldn't tell exactly what was missing because I haven't watched these things in like 10 years. But I did feel like there were moments where there'd be a cut between scenes. I'm like, I'll bet there's some there was something more there. 
um, that is just like just around the corner. So yeah, I, this is the first time I think watching two towers that I wept at the end of this movie. <laughs> like I thought the battle was incredibly stirring and moving. I felt that that whole idea of initially it was 300 people against 10,000 orcs and Urukai. They get a few elf reinforcements, but there is just something about this theme of people and nations and races who do not get along and want nothing to do each other with each other, having to come together to stop an existential crisis. And even in the face of that existential crisis, having trouble getting over their grudges. And the fact that everybody kind of comes together to fight. And then at the end, they're like, well, that was the battle. But now the battle for the all of Middle Earth is about to begin. I couldn't wait to start Return of the King. Not going to. I got to wait a year. But yeah, there's just something this time that really stirred me. And I was like, and in a way that the book did not, I agree. The Shalob climax was wonderful. And I think that would have been a great way to end. However, I think Peter Jackson, as conflicted as I am on this point, the way that he ended the two towers, I think was just about spot on. Yep. I actually, um, th this is one of those points where you're kind of bringing me around on something because uh, part of my issue with the Lord of the Rings, um, not like in general, like I'm fine with this as a thing is is the whole good versus evil kind of like it is evil because it is and they are good because they are. Um, I really despise that sort of trope and I think it's tired and worn out. And I, I can't say that Lord of the Rings did that because it was one of the first kind of huge good versus evil fantasy stories. Um, I was really bored and, and a little bit checked out, honestly. So I didn't really pick up on a lot of these themes this second time I was reading and watching where you're talking about these people who are disparate and don't really love each other coming together. Um, I think that's a level of nuance that a lot of fantasy of that era or just, you know, uh, uh, ahead of it in the chronology kind of misses. Um, and that sort of stuff is important to me because I need a focused sort of theme or group of characters. Um, and this is part of the problem I wanted to talk about is I was chatting with a friend of mine who is a film producer, mostly documentary work, but uh, it's always great when we get together because he talks about stories and I like he's one of those people like you who appreciates them on a, on a much deeper level than I think a lot of just like casual viewers would. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but when we sit down, it's like, let's have a meaty discussion about stories and what they mean. And he knows my history. He knows how much I read and how much I love it. And he told me, he said, Cole, I think we are in the golden age of fantasy adaptations. And he does not read at all. So I was like, that is a myopic and reductive view of what we are getting right now. Because uh, I told him, listen, I'm not trying to be mean. This is just how I see it. And I was like, you believe that. And it is very true for you. And that's completely valid because you have Game of Thrones, which I think is an exceptional series through most of the seasons. You have Lord of the Rings. You have Harry Potter. Um, the Sandman is a triumph, in my opinion. The Witcher, even. And I was like, the problem is we are getting adaptations of the things that the money-holding people believe to be the most palatable to the masses or which they believe will hit a niche that is willing to watch the content ad nauseum. Mm. And I said, what the problem is for me is a lot of these adaptations are one of two things. They are either huge good versus huge evil, or everybody is kind of shitty who's the least shitty. The prime examples being Lord of the Rings and Game of Thrones. I think that some series uh, have started to transcend that those tropes, The Witcher and The Sandman both being two of them. Um, but I, I said, listen, like, I have read so many books that tell so many better stories than what we are getting in TV and movies. And I get it. It's a different medium. Uh, you adapt stuff. It has to change. Sometimes you have to draw it back and tell it at a higher level. Um, but so much of what we get right now is visually beautiful and ideologically intriguing, but stylistically and narratively vapid. And uh, to his credit, he was like, I had never thought of it like that. And you have read a million fantasy books. So like, I get that that's your perspective. So it was this interesting dichotomy because like, I love the genre probably more than he does at a baseline level. Um, but I am also intrinsic, intrinsically disappointed by it. Um, 
And Rings of Power was the one that we talked about the most because I watched one episode and it was exactly what I described. In my opinion, I was like, episode one was visually beautiful, narratively vapid. Um, I've heard it gets better. I haven't seen it, so I won't who, comment who, on who's it. Who's told you it got But Now, in fairness, I have not watched Rings of Power and I will not watch Rings of Power. Um, <laughs> it's, you know, here's the thing. I think that that you and your producer friend are both right. I think we are in a golden age of fantasy adaptation, just in terms of quantity. Yep. It's kind of become the new comic book, you know, because the comic book universes are so schizophrenic right now, because who knows what the hell went on with Marvel Phase 4. I mean, I don't really, because I noped out for a it year. Is, it is a directionless pile of dung, is how I would call it. Right. And then all you have to do is read the headlines to find out what's going on with DC. So they're like, well, we need something else to fill this property vacuum. And it's interesting because a lot of this stuff is happening on what I'll call television. You know, it's not network TV. It's not legacy media stuff. Right. It's, you know, eight hour long streaming. movies on streaming services. Right. Which is um, fine which, by me. Yeah. They're, they're 10 hour movies now instead. Um, but that's that's just to say that there's a quantity of it. And I could understand how someone just kind of casually looking saying, man, it just seems like a new fantasy series is being announced or debuted or, you know, whatever, uh, every couple of months. So we must be living in a golden age of fantasy. And we are, if you're talking about quantity only, the problem Correct. is, and this is something I don't watch a lot of this stuff, but I do recognize the problems because I saw the same thing happen with comic book movies is the quality has to be there in order to retain an audience and not to taint the idea of making more of this stuff. Because if it comes out and lands with a thud because nobody connects to it, it doesn't resemble the source material, whatever, then eventually someone's going to be like, man, fantasy is a dead genre. What's next? Whereas from your expertise, you've described dozens of books to me that I have not read, but which just based on the premise alone, I thought that would make a hell of a series, but it doesn't have the brand name associated with it of like a Lord of the Rings or a Witcher. Yep. No, that's it. That's precisely right. It's um, and I, I also think there's a bit of a barrier because, you know, studios want the brand recognition and they want people to pay money in whatever form to see these things. But I think what a lot of them don't understand is these stories are so complex in nature, not just with the characters that, you know, and there are plenty of non-fantasy stories with amazing characters, but you have these magic systems and you have these different species. And some of what makes these books so interesting is stuff that is very expensive to do on screen. And I think that's the reason you end up getting a lot of like Lord of the Rings and Wheel of Time and Game of Thrones, which are, to be fair, seminal series in the genre. But a lot of them are very human centric or humanoid centric. So you can do a lot of prosthetics. You can do a lot of um, human actors, not really like wearing elf ears, things like that. Um, and it also comes into the magic for me. And this is a little bit of a specific gripe, but a lot of these things have soft magic systems. So you don't really know how they're functioning, which is fine. And I think there's a, a ton of cases to be made for soft magic systems. I like both. I love hard magic systems where there are specific rules that cannot be broken and you have to work within them. Um, but when you have these vibrant and really complex magic systems, that's just another, you know, pile or line item on the budget. Let's pull over for a second. I was listening to a YouTube lecture or something. Someone put together a video about all of the problems with Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, specifically centering around what you're talking about, which was a magic. It wasn't even a magic system, really. It was just like, hey, we can do anything we want. And so the whole thing just becomes kind of boring. Because, you know, when you can do anything, nothing you do means anything. Um, yep. And he was quoting, he presented uh, clips from a lecture. I want to say the author is named Brandon Sanderson. Is oh, that right? boy, we're getting into it. Okay. And talking about it's more interesting to have one kind of magic that you go deep into in terms of exploring its limitations and how it affects, yep. you know, people, the user and the people that it uses, rather than just saying, hey, we can do anything in this universe. Um, and he, get the person who made the video essay was giving some examples of how had Dr. Strange had some limitations put on him or say even uh, 
Scarlet Witch, especially the ideas with Scarlet Witch. Right. I'll see if I can find it and link it in the video below because it's really impressive how it would have made for a more compelling movie instead of like, hey, let's just fire these laser beams at each other and, and bring monsters out of the sky to attack New York. Yeah, so um, lots to unpack there. Let me start with Brent. <laughs> and this is all great because this is like what I'm super into right now. Um, and we will, we will get back to Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers eventually, maybe. We will, we will, <laughs> perhaps. Uh, Brandon Sanderson is one of my favorite working authors right now. Um, directly to my right, you can't see them, obviously, but I have a bunch of special editions of his books. Um, he is known for his magic systems, and part of the clips you were probably seeing were from his Brigham Young lecture series, where he teaches creative writing. This guy put, puts out multiple books a year. Many of them are over 500 pages. Some are over 1,000. Um, they are exceptional. Wow. They are it's amazing. Like the He's, it's like the Stephen King of fantasy. <laughs> exactly. He really is. And his writing is kind of similar. It's very breezy and easy and fun to read, um, but really deep mechanically and characteristically. But he uh, he wrote four secret books during the pandemic and put them on Kickstarter. Um, you, you told me, uh, yep, I remember you mentioned this. Records. This is him. Okay. Wow. Yep. Okay. Highest funded Kickstarter of all time. And um, he is now in talks with all the studios and stuff. Like he's, he, his stories are the ones I want to see brought to screen in the right way. Um, so there's a lot of agita in the fantasy community about magic systems. Um, you know, the soft and hard distinction is a spectrum. It's not a dichotomy. And I think that Brandon Sanderson's rule is like, what you can't do needs to be just as cool as what you can. Like the limitation, yes. you know, needs to be as cool as what you uh, are able to do with it. Um, a soft magic system, I think works the best when it is mysterious and sometimes a little bit dangerous. So like when you have um, Gandalf, for example, like you don't really know where his magic is coming from or what it is doing, but you kind of just like see it in action. And that's cool to me because there's a bit of a mystery behind it. And you, you can infer that there are limitations on it. You just don't know what they are. I think an even better example is George R.R. R. Martin. I read an interview with him recently and he was like, I think it's cool when magic is very limited in like the amount of people who can do it. And those who can, it is very dangerous. It's like you don't want to be messing with this stuff. And that's a way to take a soft magic system without really specific rules and put limitations on it. Like you could die, you could kill somebody. Um, and then I think there's also a case to be made for hard magic systems where like, you know, exactly what can and can't be done. It's when you get to this Dr. Strange portion where the creators teach the, or treat the lack of limitations as a tabula rasa and just start doing whatever they want. That's when you get into like, well, what's the point of it all? Right. Um, so I have to give it to Lord of the Rings. I do think it deserves credit here because the magic is so mysterious um, it feels like a finite resource. It may not be, but like, it's so limited and who can use it, how and why that it is intriguing to me. Um, and it's one of the series that has kind of brought me back from that, like only hard magic systems, uh, mentality because it's, it makes for a different type of story. You know, the type of magic system that Tolkien builds is it works so perfectly in that kind of big good versus evil, um, narrative like the mystery of what the dark side can do is a catalyst for these people uniting against it because they're all a little bit uncertain about the scope of this thing's power that they have to set their differences aside and that to me is very interesting whereas if you take a sanderson book a good person and a bad person with the same tools fighting is a really cool character moment and it's much more focused in scope um but no less epic so uh, yeah, magic systems are amazing. Brandon Sanderson is amazing. Uh, big fan. Erin's currently reading all of the Cosmere books, and she is obsessed. So uh, I'm living vicariously through her since I'm caught up. All right. Well, I'll have to get you some recommendations on the good place to start with uh, Mr. Sanderson. I have a full Cosmere reading order guide published that I can send you. Please do. Um, <laughs> Lord right, of the so, Rings. Well, no, because, and <laughs> yes, it is the perfect segue because... It's something that just occurred to me while you were talking is Lord of the Rings is known as this like magical fantasy epic, but particularly in the two towers, less so in because in, in fellowship, there's all sorts of magic everywhere. It kind of goes to the to the into the background in the two towers. There is magic. You've got the giant, you know, glowing eye of Sauron. 
you've got these orcs sort of uh, being miraculously born out of these you know mountain sludge pits um and then you've got gandalf kind of coming back from the dead after he you know slays the whole balrog thing well i'm sorry gotta silence my phone um but other than that a lot of it is about the the politics of middle earth and of course the 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 talking walking trees but i don't know that that's so much magic is just like otherworldly nature if that makes any sense um but there's not a whole lot of conjuring and like blasting of you know yep. things and all that it's mostly a war picture and yeah it's it's i don't remember much about return of the king but you know it could be that fellowship which kind of established that there is magic in this world and it can do certain things but we're just setting the table. We're not, it's not going to be like Harry Potter where they're casting spells every 10 minutes. This right. is really about how people, how people live and you know, other species and just interact with each other day to day in a world where this happens to be a background element. Yep. I, I think to me, the way I read it, and there's probably some lore heavy research people who know way more about this and have read the Silmarillion and all that to me, middle earth, like, feels like it has latent magical power and certain people can sort of channel it. And mm -hmm. like the more powerful you are, the the more you can channel. I think that's, that's what's interesting to me. And it's, it's very much like the limitations are unknown because they're unknowable. Like I, and, and nobody really seems invested in trying to find out. And I think that's what makes room for these other more personal stories. Um, not to harp on rings of power too much, but I, I like I said, I watched that first episode and I was like, this is another good versus evil story where it is black and white and I don't need to like, there's no nuance to it. I don't need to interpret who's who's doing right, like because the movie just wants to spoon feed it to me or rather the show. Um, and that that just felt so boring to me, whereas in Lord of the Rings, you have this world that is entrenched in magic and that actually does have some nuance to it. Um and I find that actually interesting and actually fun to watch, even though it's kind of couched in this massive good versus evil story. Um, and that's the other thing is, you know, in so many series and books, the magic is neutral. Um, in Game of Thrones, you you mostly find magic for nefarious ends. But in Lord of the Rings, it's like, you know, Sauron versus Gandalf is an iconic fight. You have Sauron leveraging this magic, um, but he doesn't really have a foil in, in the the movies uh other than i suppose frodo which is a very uh how do i say like a very distant gap um he's and almost think, non-magical to a fault right and i think that's that's sort of the strength and one of the things i think was very moving in terms of the way again peter jackson closes out the two towers is uh you know frodo and sam and Gollum get kind of swept up by faramir who's the brother of boromir and Faramir discovers that Frodo is carrying the one ring. And he's like, look, I'm going to take this. You're coming with us. We're going to, I'm going to use this ring to vanquish, you know, to, to basically uh, regain power and, and control because I'm one of the good ones and I can do that. And at the very last, uh, Sam says, you know, you want to know what happened to your brother? <laughs> he tried, he tried to kill Frodo to get that ring. Yes. Your brother, the noble, you know, a guy who wanted to do the right thing was turned by this thing. You have no idea what you're doing. Um, and then, so Faramir lets the three of them go so that they can continue to Mordor where Frodo is going to, you know, cast the, the ring into the volcano. At the end of it, there's sort of this air of, of hopelessness. Frodo is like, this thing is sapping my power. Uh, there's war going on. There's a chance that all of our friends are dead. What's the point? And uh, like, what, what hope do we have? And Sam basically tells him, well, we've got to keep trying, you know, maybe someday they're going to write stories about us, but you know, they don't write stories about people who faced adversity and then turned back. We've got to keep pressing on. And that was just such it. When you think about the eye of Sauron, which is basically a God on earth with some limitations because he's just an eyeball but he can influence events and, and creatures and then yes you've got frodo who as you mentioned is you know almost non-magical to a fault the idea that he is going to go up against this thing with the aid of friends friends who are going to lift him up when you know in his darkest hour that's an incredibly powerful message amidst the rest of the other messages i think in the film and it's weird to think of lord of the rings as a message movie 
But you know, particularly when we're living in such divisive times now, certainly even more so than 20 years ago when we were just, you know, 9-11 had just happened. There are all this animosity and fear and panic, and we we're about to invade Iraq. I mean, things are 10 times worse now. And I think this is the kind of film that I think more people need to watch, even if they're bored by it, uh, and just kind of say, hey, yes, there are people that I would never want to sit down and talk to in my wildest imaginations, but maybe we kind of need each other on some level. Yep. And that's why Sam is the hero of Lord of the Rings. Um, it's also an interesting comparison if you look at, like, say, Harry Potter, which I think in many ways bears similar messaging, which is about, you know, friendship and love can overcome even the greatest evil. Uh, but the main difference is that the the person who needs friends and love the most can also do insane magic by himself. Um so it, it it kind of neuters the power a little bit of of the message um with regard to harry it, it that's also more geared toward young adults so you know there's a lot of different sort of like stylistic choices there um but lord of the rings to me even though like every time i read or watch it my experience is different and my reaction to it is different i still feel as though it is a very pure kind of fantasy experience um in that it has relevance no matter when you're reading. And that speaks exactly to what you were saying is you can read Lord of the Rings through the lens of whatever year you're reading it in. And there's something to glean from it. Um, and the lesson isn't always going to be as impactful. Uh, it may be more three years down the line, who knows, but there's always something there. And I think that's what gives it so much staying power, obviously is you read it and you find something new. Um, Sometimes you find just a little quote that hits you a little bit harder this time. Um, sometimes you've read 50 other fantasy books and you notice something in Lord of the Rings that came from it. There's, It's such, such a deep and dense well of lore that uh, there's, there's always something to be drawn from it and it never runs dry, at least so far. Yeah, I, there, there are three things that I want to kind of tackle as we wind down and by introducing three things, I guarantee that we're not really winding down, but you know, <laughs> Um, and help me remember all of them because I've had very little sleep. Um, one is sort of tying back into what we were discussing. Um, it's the effect of this great evil on three characters in this story. Uh, one is Frodo, because we can see that the, the ring is calling to him. And it's it, he is not the same person at the end of this second installment as he was the beginning of the first movie. Um, and he's certainly going to change by the end of uh, Return of the King. The second is Gollum who has been completely corrupted by the power of the ring. He spent, you know, years or centuries or however the hell old he was since he was exiled in the cave, like just holding on to this thing. And the other is King Theoden, who when we see him is being influenced by Grima Warntongue, uh, who is the voice of Saruman and by comparison, uh, Sauron whispering in his ears, you know, basically keeping him away from truth and light and his family and making him make all these bad decisions. It's just interesting to see this all this complete spectrum of the corruption of the ring presented in one movie. You see the beginning of corruption, you see the sort of middle stage in Theoden, and then you see the absolute you know end of it with uh, Gollum. And yet you also see how the manipulation uh, changes and evolves to suit the people that are being manipulated by the power because there's good and treachery in in both cases Gollum, you know he's the alter ego of his original name smeagol and we get a fantastic performance by andy circus that's the second point i wanted to talk about uh you know this was a revolution in cgi like motion capture uh and it's it's astonishing to watch even now 20 years later i mean i feel like this is a more convincing character than anything i saw in the second avatar movie um the third thing, and I know I'm just kind of carpet bombing these topics at you, but I don't want to forget them. The third one is uh, Eowyn, played by Miranda Otto, who, correct me if I'm wrong, is she a uh, creation for the second movie? Because I don't remember seeing or hearing her mentioned in the novel. I thought I remembered her from the book, but maybe she's in Return of the King. Uh, and that's the one I haven't read in the longest, so... I don't actually know, um, but I really like her character, actually. She's great. And, you know, one of the complaints that I've heard about Tolkien is that he didn't like there are no 
like hardly any women in Lord of the Rings. And I understand that criticism. I don't quite accept it because he was writing it at a different time and he had very much things in mind and there wasn't necessarily uh, the demand for inclusivity uh, back then as there is today. But I will say in adapting Lord of the Rings and forgive me, folks, I, as I mentioned, I read this court, this book over the course of a month, usually about four o'clock in the morning. Um, so I, but I swear, I don't recall her being in the book, certainly not the capacity that she is in the movie. Like there's this whole scene where Wormtongue kind of corners her in a room and is trying to put the moves on her <laughs> like, wow. Um, but I think that if she is an addition to the films, it is a great addition because it does speak to, you know, what role do women place uh, play in Middle Earth if they're not like elven princesses or, you know, because <laughs> we've we saw Galadriel and we saw Arwen, but we don't really see you know, kind of a person's eye view of this, even though she's the daughter of the king, she has what could be called her place in this society and she's not happy about it. Um, she wants to do more, but she has sort of a, what might be seen as a realistic expectation of her prospects, which uh, change and are awakened uh, over the course of the third movie. I remember that much, but I don't know, know about the book because I haven't read the third novel yet. So yeah, um, unpack all that with me, Cole, in five minutes, go. No. Yep, okay, so to your first point, love it. Uh, I would add Sam to the list of, he's kind of the control, uh, whereas Frodo, Theoden, and um, Gollum are the variables, right? They are these various stages. And I really think Sam is a standout character for me, both in the books and the movies. Yeah. Um, I appreciate him more every time because it's so easy in fantasy to kind of cast aside the best friend character as just like, there because they are um and so many times that's kind of what fantasy best friends are uh the guy in the chair as ned might say from spider-man i just watched no way home the other day it's been a, a season of movies for me um so i i love that especially when you add salmon as kind of this fourth control like he's the one that isn't into it at all and, and it really provides a reference point as you look at these other people um what can I say about Andy Serkis that hasn't already been said? Um, well, I believe he narrated a version of the audiobooks. So mm. if you're ever inclined to listen to one of the books instead of just reading, um, that seems awesome. And um, I, I agree with Eowyn 100%. Um, who? Okay, I always forget her name. Liv Tyler's character. Arwen, yeah. Arwen. Um some of the most awkward kissing I've ever seen in a movie. She kind of just like bites down on his lip with her two lips. Um, I, I watched those scenes and I was like, what? Um, <laughs> and I, that was just a bit odd to me. I, I, there's, I have no context for it. I have no deep analysis about it. I just, I watched it and I was like, okay, um, cool. She, she's always been sort of the weakest link for me in this movie i think she's got a great look i like her in other movies kind of but you know i don't consider her i don't i can't think of a Liv tyler performance where i'm like yes she is a really fine actress that she's thing you do she's serviceable i haven't seen that in a long time oh um, i love that movie I, I i should i should watch that again um does that turn 25 next year and if so let's talk about it but um no, uh, yeah. So Arwen is, you know, she's fine. What I really liked was, you know, Eowyn's relationship with Aragorn. Um, play, you know, Viggo Mortensen continues to just blow me away with every passing minute as I revisit these films. He's so good. But he's. Aragorn goes, this... um, everybody loves Legolas, but Aragorn can get it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Legolas is fine. I appreciate him more, but I'm like, yeah, he's a great comedy duo with John Reese davies as, you know, Gimli. I think I, I never really picked up on that that gag where there's that one battle where Gimli gets knocked over by that hyena wolf thing. And then an orc falls on him and then another hyena wolf thing falls on him. <laughs> just like this quadruple Decker sandwich. Um, but no. So Aragorn is in fashion. He's in love with Arwen, but it's kind of a love that can never be type of thing. And he's out on this quest. He meets Eowyn and they're both attracted to each other. You can tell that. And she really, you know, she makes eyes at him. But at one point when he returns from after having fallen over a, a waterfall, which again, I think I feel like is an addition. Uh, if it wasn't in the if it was in the novel, I feel like it was like a paragraph or something where this is more drawn out. He disappears from the whole party for a while when he comes back. 
Legolas gives him that butterfly elf jewel thing that Arwen had given him and he takes it and she sees across the room and she kind of just like understands. You can see it like, I'm, I'm just not going to touch that. That's cool. And I think that's a, that's a level of nuance that we don't usually get you know, in these kinds of movies, either he's going to like give her some big sweeping speech about like, Hey, it's not going to happen. Or he's going to cheat on Arwen or whatever, but it's just, all of this is told in a, a few looks and yet you get an entire monologues worth of narration, much like I'm giving now, sorry, um, <laughs> without saying a word. Yeah. I can't say anything uh, that'll add to that one. I appreciated <laughs> it too. I, yeah. Eowyn is a, uh, I, I always like when she's on screen. I was just, I, I see her and I'm like, oh, sweet. What's she up to? You know, uh, and I can't say that for every character. Um, lastly, it's something that whenever I go back and vi visit these movies, even with the first time I saw it, I didn't like any of them, but I could appreciate that Peter Jackson was the perfect filmmaker to make these movies because he takes the material seriously. He's got a deep respect for the lore and staying true to Tolkien's vision. But he also, you can tell, he came from like the air, the the genre of low budget horror movies because there's some shots in here that are just completely gonzo gross. and nuts and well, gross, but just kind of fun. Like there's yeah. almost these Evil Dead kind of swirling camera moves and and creatures getting up in the face of the camera and even when Gollum just like will just randomly go bah! <laughs> like that doesn't make any sense, but I love it. And only Peter Jackson Jackson could pull that off in this context. You know, this this brings me to one point that's probably like uh, related to what I said earlier, but I think that there's sometimes a cognitive mismatch between creators and the fantasy that they're adapting um, because so many dramas these days take themselves so seriously. And I think we're kind of getting away from that. Like if you look at Better Call Saul, it is both hilarious and heartbreaking and really like well dr dramatized like it's it's an amazing series so is breaking bad and you know any other number of uh, amazing series but like i think that people are just starting to realize that like fantasy doesn't have to be so like masturbatory it doesn't have to just be like <laughs> we're so serious about this fantasy world like yeah you should take the material seriously because there are things you can draw from fantasy that you can't draw from real world events um but you can also have a ton of fun with it and you know like say what you will about phase four, but I think Marvel kind of paved a lot of this way, which is like, they had really funny scenes in some of their movies and they didn't, they didn't make everybody take every hero. Like they were just, you know, this staunch good person who could never make a joke. Um, there was a little bit of flair to them. And I think that fantasy has yet to fully catch up. There are moments in Game of Thrones that I think do well. Harry Potter had a few laughs here and there. I'm not saying we need a full fantasy comedy in every adaptation, but like these people, though completely fake and in completely made up worlds are still living lives. And there, there are still moments of happiness and humor that they can experience. And I think this film has a few of them. Um, there's the little conversation Gimli has about the women dwarves, how nobody can tell them apart because of the beards, like just a silly little lore dump, but like those moments ground us in the story and make it feel like they are living in a real world. Uh, and that's important in this type of thing, especially if you want the buy-in from people who aren't already entrenched in fantasy. Right. I think another great example and, and one that, demonstrates a deafness with comedy and drama is when Theoden is released from Sauron's spell uh, or Sauron's spell, sorry. Uh, or is it Saruman? Who's casting the spell over him? Is it the I evil eye or the wizard? I thought it was Who's... Saruman, but okay. transitive property, right? Like it's it's just coming down the chain. It's trickle down magicnomics. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, but there's a great, first of all, transformation scene, because when we first see a th see Theoden, he's on the throne, he's slumped over, he's like completely gray and wrinkled, he's got the milky eyes, but then when the spell is broken, it's almost seamless, the, the transformation back into the younger version of himself. I mean, he's no spring chicken, but he looks like he's 65 instead of 105. But when he realizes what's happened to him and that Warm Tongue has been playing him this entire time, there's a great kind of comedic scene where he looks around the room and he sees Wormtongue and that cuts to Wormtongue being thrown out of the castle and like kind of tumbling down the steps like, ha ha. But then Theoden comes out with the sword and he's like, 
you motherfucker. And he's about to like, you can just feel the rage and everything and the Aragorn stops him. So it's not exactly dramatic, but it's not funny either. But it all happens within the course of a few seconds. Um, so yeah, I think that that balance also, something I think Tolkien got right uh, in the book. I mean, he got a lot of things right in the book, just me nitpicking, you know. I mean, um, the ends are hilarious just in their whole way of life. Right. The, the, you know, the, the deliberation, which we've kind of talked about, but the 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 patter between or the banter between Gimli and Legolas throughout the book is something I think that Jackson didn't have to adapt. He just took it off the page and put it into the screen. Like the whole at the Helm's Deep battle, they're talking, I've got nine. And Legolas is like, I've just killed 17 orcs. And there's just like this constant battle back and forth of them trying to one ape each other. It's that, that, that kind of levity that, as you were saying, it's not as buttoned up, you know, just because it's, you know, old English or, or whatever, it doesn't have to be completely serious and dry because people, people have never been like that. There've been yep. weirdos and freaks and, and comedians throughout, you know, human history. I think to, to bring that out along with the drama is kind of the perfect marriage. And that's what he's achieved here. It's a glaringly bardless series. Um, I will say that, you know, um, I've actually been pondering an essay for Tor about sentient objects and how they bring levity in fantasy. Um, maybe I'll bust it out and think about other ways that that people inject those little moments of humor into fantasy because sentient objects are one. I've read so many books with hilarious talking swords, um, but, but you'd be surprised, man. I'm just telling you, Brandon <laughs> Sanderson has one. Hey. Um but yeah, there's there are so many ways that fantasy authors do this. I think uh, another fun one, and I actually did write an essay about this, is uh, creating pseudo profanities. So like taking words that are not profane, but treating them as semi profane exclamations. Uh, Sanderson does this all the time. Uh, a few other sci fi authors I really enjoy do, and it's uh, it, it it's both a world building tool and a humor tool, and it just works so. Um, I look out for those little details when I watch movies like this and just see like what small thing that is innocuous to most people makes me think, oh, this is a different world, you know, um, and Lord of the Rings has plenty of those. Did you ever watch Firefly? No, I've heard nothing but amazing things, though. It's pretty spectacular. And they made a movie a couple years after that because they only I think Serenity, right? Serenity, because that's the name of the ship. But I feel like there was if i'm going to get this wrong but it was like eight or 13 episodes filmed in a one long story for it has a beginning middle and an end but they only aired i think three or four episodes and then they aired them out of order so nobody watched it it completely flopped and only got a movie because like fan outrage and following when they released the whole thing on dvd but yeah it's that kind of thing where it's a space fantasy world but they have like uh, in, one of their swear words is instead of God damn, it's Goram. Uh, yep. And, you know, these, these these little details and they they paint this entire world. Like, what would the world look like if the main powers on the planet Earth were like Russia and China? I think it were something like that. Like, what would that do and how would that affect space exploration? Um, so, yeah, that's a whole other thing. But, Cole, thank you very much for for talking Lord of the Rings, the Two Towers. I, I hope that the excruciating boredom of watching the <laughs> film again is made up for by this, what I think was a really fun conversation that actually covered the movie, sort of. It did. We did it. Um, you know, I think that part of the boredom came from, I watched probably seven movies in the past two weeks, which is very rare for me. I watched Love Actually, which is a repeat viewing. Um, I watched the Matilda musical, which was fucking delightful. I adored that thing. Um, I watched Knives Out for the second time. I watched Glass Onion. I watched No Way Home for the second time, Guardians of the Galaxy Christmas special. So it's it's been a very crowded, um, and a lot of those were, you know, fast paced, like quick fire and new stuff for me. Whereas uh, Lord of the Rings was something I had seen multiple times. But uh, I do want to plug really quick. I sent you the video essay, but there's this um, video essayist called Folding Ideas. He's absolutely phenomenal, but he did an exhaustive, like researched look at Ralph Bakshi's Lord of the Rings. Uh, he intersplices it with stories, obviously, about th these adaptations, Peter Jackson's and um, the 70s version of The Hobbit, which I positively adore. Um, really cool look at like what could have been for the LOTR cinematic universe um, and kind of like a philosophical pondering on 
on fantasy adaptations. Um, I I need to rewatch it. I watched it last year sometime, and I just adored it. Um, but but really cool watch if you're into Lord of the Rings. Well, I I saw that you sent it to me. I did not have a chance to watch it because I've been mired in other things. But I will watch it. And if you remind me, we'll talk about it next year when we discuss the return of the king. Um, and also link the uh, the uh, video essay down below along with other things we've talked about. Speaking of which, Cole, where can people find you? What do you want to plug? Uh, as always, the quilttolive.com. I'm reviewing books. Um, Brandon Sanderson has a new one coming out in January, which I will be reviewing. Um, it's a secret project. He hasn't like spoiled. The, he has spoiled the titles for those who want to be spoiled. So I won't do it here. Um, but it is within the Cosmere. Uh, my Cosmere reading order guide is on the Quilt to Live. I'll send you a link as well, Ian. Um, and then you can find my work at Tor. I've got some good stuff coming up in the new year. Uh, soonest one will be five stories that draw on Greek mythology, because that's been on my mind lately, having watched uh, The Sandman and having played the game Hades. So, uh, And as always, ColeRush.com has all of my work. Awesome. Well, thank you again, sir. And uh, happy end of 2022. Great things ahead in 2023. Uh, this is a teaser. We we just, before we went, well, sort of live, before we started doing what you're listening to now or watching, we talked about, we mapped out 2023 as far as late screenings and page to screen. So there's going to be some great, weird, fun things ahead. So thank you very much, Cole. Have a happy new year. And um, yeah, uh, I don't know, knives out, rings out rings up something what do we how do we sign off this thing um ho there what business i guess that's more of a greeting <laughs> fairly well and happy new year everybody perfect all right man thanks <laughs> catch you later <laughs> bye <laughs>